Okay, kids, Charlie Busso here. We're going to be doing the uh, bonding notes on page 16, number 125. We're going to start with, and we're going to get to the, to the very end, I think. We'll be finished in a, in a little bit. This is something we talked about earlier in the year, oxidation numbers. They're on the periodic table. They're known as the selected oxidation states. They're the numbers in the top right-hand corner. Now, if you're a metal, those numbers are always positive, and those are the types of cations you make. Sodium is a plus one in that box. It's a positive one ion. Uh, beryllium's got a plus two, makes a positive two ion. Titanium's got three positive numbers because it makes three kinds of positive cations, right? It can, can kind of flex and bend and make different kinds of cations. Now, for the nonmetals, there are negative numbers at the top. The very top number is the kind of anion it makes, but all of those numbers, positive and negative, for the nonmetals are called relative oxidation numbers. Excuse me, I'm drinking seltzer. And those relative oxidation numbers are used to help figure out the ratios of atoms to atoms, what's possible for molecular compounds. All right, so we're gonna review that right now. So. Long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far. You know, it's really funny. I just saw on the internet just a moment ago before I started this, there was a photograph of Alec Guinness. He played Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars. And Mark Hamill, who played uh, Luke, uh, they were talking about it was Alec Guinness's 62nd birthday. And they were, there was a photograph behind the scenes. They were all in costume, but they were drinking styrofoam cups. They're having a little toast with some warm champagne, they said for Alec Guinness's 62nd birthday. And, uh, and there it is. There's a quote from Star Wars. Star Wars is an important part of my life. And uh, I watched it when I was your age and it really impacted me. I always wanted to live on a planet with two suns, like Tatooine. Okay, oxidation numbers. I'm gonna learn about them again right now. So hydrogen has a positive one and a negative one oxidation number. They're right in there. Oxygen, has just a negative two. So when we, when we wanna figure out all the possible hydrogen and oxygen compounds, we use this little T-chart and we fill it in with H on the left and O on the right. And we write down all the oxidation numbers and we try to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So if we list H has a positive one and a negative one oxidation number and O has just a negative two, we have to go through these to see what combinations balance. Now, the positive one and the negative two, we have to figure out, can we have a positive and a negative come together to add up to zero? Sure, but not positive or negative two. We're gonna need two of those positive ones, which means we're gonna need two H's to balance against an O. So the positive one oxidation number and the negative two oxidation number for oxygen indicates that H2O is possible, of course, that's water. Now, if we looked at the negative oxidation number, there really is no way for a negative and a negative to combine in any ratio to sum to zero. A negative and negative is still negative. So that negative one oxidation number is not useful here. So we just put an X in it. The only possible combination is gonna be H2O. There's no HO, there's no H3O, there's no other possible combinations of positives and negatives, simple whole number ratios, other than H2O. So we use these oxidation numbers to do stuff like this. We also can just figure out what the oxidation numbers are based upon the compounds. So if we have hydrogen and chlorine, hydrogen has got two oxidation numbers and chlorine's got four. You put your finger in box 17. What are the relative oxidation numbers? What's the oxidation number for hydrogen? And what's the oxidation number for chlorine? So let's see. Hydrogen's a plus one, chlorine's a negative one. And when we combine those oxidation numbers, they sum to zero. Perfectly good. But you know what? They're just numbers, right? So if we use the hydrogen with a positive one, I'm sorry, with a negative one, chlorine makes a positive one. So we can have it both ways. These numbers just help us figure out what are the ratios. They don't really mean these are the ions that are forming. They're not, they're just numbers. So 
the numbers we have for hydrogen and oxygen show two combinations that work for HCl, but that means one-to-one -one is okay. Carbon dioxide. Carbon has three oxidation numbers. Oxygen has just negative two. So we have one carbon and two hydrogens. One carbon, that's my phone. One carbon and two oxygens. Each oxygen is negative two. That means the oxygens provide a negative four. In order for carbon dioxide to exist, carbon has to be a positive four, and guess what? That works. The positive carbon, positive four, and two negative twos, that will sum up to zero. That means CO2 is possible. So if we have CO2, what are the oxidation numbers? Well, the carbon is positive four, and the oxygens are both negative two. Arsenic trichloride. Arsenic is element number 33. Right? And if we look, chlorine is a negative one oxidation number, and arsenic, there's got to be one of those. It can be a positive three. Right? So if arsenic, we say, is positive three, the chlorines can each be negative one. One positive three and three negative ones sums to zero. So these are what are called possible oxidation numbers or relative oxidation numbers. These numbers mean these compounds can exist. Yeah. If they're molecules, they sum to zero, like sulfur dioxide, sulfur, and two oxygens. Each oxygen must be negative two. In order for sulfur dioxide to exist, sulfur has to make a positive four oxidation number, and it does. There it is. Now, for the chromate ion, this is not a molecule. This is an ion. It has a negative two charge. So its oxidation numbers are going to sum up to negative two. There are four oxygens, each is negative two. That's a total of negative eight. What would chromium have to be to combine with a negative eight oxidation to give us a total of negative two? Well, if chromine, if you put your finger in box number 24, chromium would have to be a positive six, and that's possible. Chromium makes a positive six. So if chromium's positive six, and each of the four oxygens negative two, that sums up to negative two, which is fine because this is a chromate ion. Now the permanganate ion, it's on table E, MnO4, negative one. We have four oxygens again. The oxygens are each negative two. That's a negative eight there. But the whole permanganate is negative one. That would mean in order for this to exist, the manganese, element 25, would have to have a positive seven. And guess what? That's a mistake because it, is, it does make a positive seven. I'm going to fix this right now. Who made this slideshow? Who made it? It's a negative one, and manganese is a positive seven. Look at that. Fixed. Fixed. Ammonia. Ammonia can be negative three for nitrogen and three positive ones for hydrogen. That sums up to zero. Ooh, I got one little mistake still, right? Look at that. It sums up to a negative one. Who made this slideshow? Sometimes, you know, I think what happens is I'm trying to copy and paste and I change some things because it's quicker, but actually when you try to go fast and you take shortcuts, you screw it all up. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium's a positive one ion. When it's a metal, it's got to be positive one. There's no choice for that. Now, the oxygen has a negative two oxidation number, and the hydrogen's got a positive one oxidation number, and that's going to sum up to zero as well. KClO3, potassium chlorate, that's the name of it. Potassium's a plus one. Each of the oxygens is a negative two. Now, the chlorines is a big choice. There's a couple. There's three or four of them. Well, let's do the ones we know. The potassium's a positive one. The oxygens are each negative two. So in order for this to sum to zero, we have to have a K, I'm sorry, a Cl positive five. And that's possible. Chlorine has a positive five oxidation number. The, the combination just shows that these, these formulas will work. Carbon monoxide is different than carbon dioxide. We got them both together. Oxygen has to be negative two, but carbon's got a couple of choices. In this case, in carbon monoxide, carbon's a positive two and oxygen's a negative two. That sums to zero. But in carbon dioxide, carbon would have to have a different oxidation number for this to work, and carbon can make a positive four oxidation number. The oxidation numbers are numbers 
that help us decide what ratios of, of the formulas are possible. And for carbon and oxygen, there's two formulas, carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. They both work because carbon can have different oxidation numbers. Dihydrogen sulfate nitrate, let's go, let's get these all done. Dihydrogen sulfate's H2SO4. Now, the H's are probably positive, but they could be negative. Let's see what we got. The oxygens have to be negative too. There's four negative two, so that's negative eight. The H's and the S's have to come up with positive eight, so we might as well make them all positive, otherwise it won't work. H is a plus one, and the sulfur is a positive six, and all those oxidation numbers sum to zero. Now for the nitrate ion, this is ion, it's gonna sum up to a negative one total charge. We have three oxygens that have to be negative two. So that's a negative six. How do we get to negative one? Well, nitrogen has to make a positive five and positive five is on the list. Nitrogen has a lot of oxidation numbers. Now with nitrogen dioxide, this sums to zero, it's a molecule. There's two oxygens, negative two, negative two, that's a negative four. That means nitrogen in this case is a positive four oxidation number. In phosphorus trichloride, right? We'll give the phosphorus a plus three and the chlorine's negative one, or I think we can go the other way as well. I think phosphorus can be a negative three and chlorines can be a positive one. Either way, a one to three phosphorus chlorine ratio is possible and they sum to zero. All right, this is called intermolecular bonding jeopardy. Now in jeopardy, I give you the answer, you have to give me the question. It keeps ammonia and H3 together as a liquid. What intermolecular bonding, what, 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 would, what would be the question? We would say, what is dipole attract, hydrogen bonding? It's fancy dipole, super dipole. NH3 has hydrogen bonding. We have polar bonds and polar molecules that contain hydrogen, hydrogen bonding. Bromine's a liquid, but it keeps iodine as a solid. What is, of course, electron dispersion? And it keeps phosphorus trichloride together as a liquid. PCL3 is polar bonding, but no hydrogen. So this is what is dipole attraction, okay? You should be able to recognize those three kinds of intermolecular attractions. Now, the difference between bond polarity and molecular polarity. Now, this, sign, this slide says, who has the guts to stand up and orate this answer? I tease, really, in a class, I would say, come on, who's got the guts to say this? If you get it right, you're the best. If you get it wrong, everybody's so happy you did it, it wasn't them. So really, what's the difference? I would ask you, but I'm gonna have to just tell you. Bond polarity when there's a difference in electronegativity value. For instance, in water, the oxygen has a much higher electronegativity than the hydrogen. That means the oxygen pulls the electrons harder than the hydrogens. That means the oxygen side is negative most of the time. The hydrogen sides of the molecule are positive most of the time. And those bonds are polar. The bonds are polar. Now, molecular polarity has to do with the shape. Water does not have radial symmetry. There's one line of symmetry, gingerbread man symmetry, which is called uh, bilateral. But if you cut it across left to right, the top has two hydrogens and the bottom would have two pairs of unshared electrons. That means this molecule does not have radial symmetry. The molecule is polar. Now, CCL4, now honestly, it's gonna be built more in a triangular pyramid shape, but when we draw it, it looks like a, an X. If you cut it down or across on either diagonal, you end up with one half of a carbon and two chlorines on both sides. This molecule that has polar bonds exhibits radial symmetry, which means all the polarity in the bonds is balanced. So this becomes a nonpolar molecule. Both water and carbon, di uh, carbon tetrachloride have polar bonds, but water does not have radial symmetry. So water is a polar molecule. Carbon tetrachloride is a nonpolar molecule. Now, there's a picture of the A-train, Euclid Avenue. There's a long story. Euclid Avenue is the first station in Brooklyn. In Queens, the subway is really the elevated line, the L. The trains run upstairs on the, on the tracks in the sky. You got to go up a couple of flights of stairs. But right near where I lived, right near the Queens and Brooklyn border, the first exit in Brooklyn, the first stop in Brooklyn is underground. So you can actually stand in the front of the train where it says A so you know which train it is. 
um, you go down into the ground. And there's a picture of the train in Euclid Avenue. Now, if you took the train from Ozone Park, where I live, just three stations to Euclid Avenue, on the way, you'd go through the tunnel and go into underground. You'd become into the subway. You'd be in Brooklyn. And then you could get off and go back the other way. You could resonate back and forth from City Line Brooklyn to Ozone Park in Queens. All right? That's what they call those two neighborhoods. City Line is in Brooklyn because it's the line between the city of Brooklyn, which is really an old expression. Brooklyn used to be its own city. And, and Queens was not even part of the city then. So the city edge of the city was the edge of Brooklyn. Now Queens is in the city as well. You can go back and forth and back and forth, out of the tunnel into the L, off the L, back into the tunnel, up and down, up and down, all day for the same price. Go back and forth and back and forth. Ozone Park is where I lived. And ozone is a molecule that exhibits what's called a resonating bond. Look at these pictures here in the middle. We have a double bond on the left, a normal double bond. And on the right, we seem to have some funky thing going on. And then that's not stable. So it immediately switches. So we get a nice double bond on the right and that funky thing on the left. And it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's shown a little better on the bottom. The bottom, the bottom left corner, the leftmost oxygen over here, it has six red dots. The oxygen in the middle has blue dots. And then look at that bottom right corner one right here. These dots are not bonding at all. These are actually unshared pairs of electrons. The, the bond in between the middle and the right oxygen there, it's not really a bond. But then it switches and there's a double bond on the right. Then it switches back and there's a double bond on the left. It goes back and forth and back and forth, just like you can do on the train. Once you get on the train, you go back and forth and back and forth. You just get off. Go across the platform, you go the other direction. You don't have to pay again. Once you're in, you're in. You could stay in until they close the subway, which is hardly ever. They used to never close it. Now they've had a couple of hurricanes and the COVID thing has been a problem with cleaning. But it used to be you could get on the subway and live on it forever, right? You can get haircuts, you can eat restaurants, you could perform music, you, there's bathrooms. You could live in the subway. You could. Crazy. All right. Once and for all, carbon monoxide, this is not gonna be working, right? Because carbon has four valence electrons and oxygen has six. The only way this is gonna work is if they make a double polar covalent bond and then those two extra electrons from the top of oxygen jump in the middle. Look at the dots on the top. Carbon's got four red dots. Oxygen's got six blue dots. They're sharing two pairs of electrons on the bottom and then those two blue dots on the top they're really both from oxygen and it lets carbon borrow them. So carbon can feel like it has an octet and oxygen gets the octet. But really those two dots on the top both belong to oxygen. So it's not a real bond. We can't, it's not a triple bond, right? It's not, it's not a triple bond. It's a double bond plus something weird called the coordinate covalent bond. New York State Regents loves that. It's, it's a, uh, Carbon monoxide is important. We have to have carbon monoxide detectors in our house. It's a poison, it can kill you. And it's got a weird funky bonding circumstance and we have to keep you informed. It's called coordinate covalent. You can't have just a coordinate covalent. This is a double polar covalent plus a coordinate covalent bond. All right, true or false. I think we're near the end, right? This is it. True and false. Ionic bonds can be single or double bonds. No way. It's absolutely false, right? Ionic bonds are positive and negative, and they just become uh, ionic. Covalent bonds cannot be nonpolar. Of course, it's silly. Anytime you have two atoms with the same electronegativity difference, there's no difference. That makes them nonpolar. So most of the Hunkelbrift twins that make single bonds, um, and a lot of other atoms that bond together have... have uh, Nonpolar bonds. Covalent bonds can be polar or nonpolar. Oxygen have double polar covalent bonds. No. Oxygen has double nonpolar covalent bonds because there's no difference in electronegativity. They are double, but they're nonpolar. Nitrogen molecules have double nonpolar covalent bonds. No, again. They do make nonpolar covalent bonds, but they're actually triple bonds. Hydrogen atoms can make single or double covalent bonds. No. 
Hydrogens have one electron and they have one orbital, which means they only can borrow one more electron. They can only make one bond. They're limited. They can't make more than one bond. O atoms, oxygen atoms, must make double bonds only, like an oxygen O2, right? No, water is a good example. They have to make two bonds. They can be double or they can be both single, but they do have to make two, but not necessarily just double. Water is sometimes a straight line molecule by shape. Never. We're talking about the end of life as we know it. Water has to be bent. It has to be polar. Because it's polar, when it freezes, it creates that hexagon shape that allows the, the density of ice to be slightly less than the density of water and it will float. If it was a straight line, water molecules would freeze into a brick shape. They'd be more dense than a liquid. They would sink and then probably in 50 years, all the water on earth would be frozen, except for in the summer, some of it would melt at the top and then it would freeze in the winter. There'd be no life on earth. So if you ever draw water in a straight line, basically you're saying, the end of life on earth as we know it is coming. Molecules with polar bonds can never be non-polar molecules. Totally false. Carbon monoxide, I'm sorry, uh, carbon tetrahydride, methane, four polar bonds, but they have radial symmetry. Molecular polarity and, and bond polarity are different. You can have polar bonds that are balanced. Carbon dioxide has double polar covalent bonds, but it's got radial symmetry. Molecules with nonpolar bonds only can never be polar molecules, all right? If you have nonpolar bonds, you can never be polar. That's not true either, right? NBR3 is in the shape of a triangular pyramid with three bottom corners and a middle, no top, right? It's kind of like a, like a, a spider almost. The bonds are nonpolar, but it does not have radial symmetry at the top of Nitrogen is a pair of electrons. It's an imbalance in shape. So you can be polar. And that's probably not as polar as some molecules, but no, it's polar molecule. The weakest intermolecular bond is the dipole. Also, no, look at this. No, right? Electron dispersion forces are the weakest. Dipole in the middle and hydrogen bonding are the highest. Look at this. They're all false. Obviously, I was pulling your leg. I mean, this is true. Now I'm all confused. These are all false. That is true. None of them were true. I was just being cute. I made them all false for you. Hey, look at that. See this guy? Look at that picture. First of all, right? I like these pictures. Here is a man that won the chemistry Nobel Prize. Look at the pictures behind him. You got all kinds of numbers and lines and funky math and molecule shapes and double and single bonds with sulfur up there. He studied bonding. He wins the Nobel Prize for understanding bonding at, a, at the Nobel Prize level. I actually shook hands with him. I could cry. One of the most important people I have ever met in my life, right? He actually came to Vessel High School. This hand shook that hand, the one with the chalk. He has chalk. I like chalk. We don't have that anymore. I have no idea what he studied, right? His, his stuff is so far over my head, I don't understand it, okay? Bonding is deep. Right? This is a beginning introduction to bonding. Some of the stuff I told you is a little bit loosey-goosey, um, but it's how you learn. You got to learn the easy stuff, then you learn the real stuff, right? When you learn to play baseball, you hit the ball off a tee. Nobody even throws it to you. I mean, that's not really baseball, but you got you to gotta begin. Some of it's hard too, right? I'm smart. I don't know what the heck he even studied. I don't even understand it, right? So it's all relative. You do your best. That's all that can matter. And... Uh, you know, that's all you can hope for. Keep trying, don't give up. Peace, love, and chemistry. Bye-bye. I love my job. See ya.